start tonight's recording. Uh, tonight we are going to dive heavily into all of the different data types that we can use within our database. Um, some of the majority of these are SQL standard data types um, or there is a SQL standard equivalent. Some of them are going to be Postgres specific and frankly the Postgres specific ones are more fun but we'll talk about all of them. So the context of these data types uh, is going to be for creating the tables that we'll be making. Um, I think for the, the next couple of weeks within this, this class, we will look at uh, the Mike Spikes data set. Um, I think I've graded most of those. If there are one or, one or two I haven't, it's my fault, probably not yours, so I'll get back to that after class tonight. Um, but we're going to spend a couple of weeks kind of building out this data set. Uh, and then after that, we'll start working on our own individual projects. But when we, when we go through these different data, data types, um, I want to kind of have a, a conversation around some of them on how we could use them, where we wouldn't use them, that kind of things. Um, so, yeah, so for the, the creating a table, you know, these, this is a slide from last week. Um, in this table, we have five columns, uh, we have an int a variable character length of up to 255 characters three times and a date field. Uh, there are a lot more data types that we can use within the database. So, oh my, my typing, I swear. Um, talking about numeric types, we have a different range of integers. So we're going from our, our integer to our small int to our big int. Uh, it all depends on how much memory or how much, uh, yeah, how much memory is available for that specific field in the database. So uh, if we have an integer column, each record will allocate four bytes to the integer in that column. If we have a big int, as an example, we can have up to eight bytes in that um, in that field or that attribute. And you'll see that those are all, the integer big int and small int are all signed integers, so they can be positive or negative. From there, you have uh, the, the decibel numbers, decimal numbers, not numeric, numer numeric, double precision, uh, real. Those are, are floating point numbers. And again, it's, it's similar in concept to the different sizes. Um, so like a double precision floating point number is an eight byte number versus the float four or the real is a four byte number. Um, I think the numbers or the, the labels on the left, like big int, double precision, integer, money, etc., are the Postgres name for the ANSI the ANSI SQL name of the data fields, or it's vice versa. Um, the ones on the left, the type name, not the alias, are the things we'll typically use within the class. Um, but in Postgres, either works. Uh, I, I haven't used MySQL or Oracle in years, so I couldn't tell you which one works in Oracle or not. Um, now they have a specific data type for money um, because, you know, if you've seen Superman or Office Space, we know that rounding of money can cause issues. And so there's a specific data type just for a money field. Um, and I threw the Boolean field in here as well because it's kind of numeric, um, but it's, it's a, a simple true-false uh, field with, with no other values available for it. Why do you have an asterisk um, in the front of the... Because it's not really a number, but I've, this was the slide I wanted to put it on. That's it. It was my reminder to say that. Good question. Um, is there a difference between int and integer? No, there's not. So that this this table is basically straight off the uh, Postgres website, and the integer column, or the sorry, the integer type can also be labeled as int or int four. So when you're creating your table. You can use any one of those three labels for your data type, and it'll be the same thing. It'll be a signed four byte in integer. Okay. So in a real world 
scenario, how many of these are you really going to use most of the time when you're building a database? Um, you very well may use all of them. Really? Yeah, so going just to the integer field, um, why would you have a 2-byte, a 4-byte, or an 8-byte integer? I guess if it's a set identification number, or you're expecting a certain size, things like that, where, yeah, and then, then you are saving space, especially if you're going to have millions and millions of rows in this database. Yeah, exactly, or, you know, billions. You know, the, the system I work on uh, at, at work, we, we I think we send billions of messages a month which means as far as our outbound messages go it's billions but then we get all this feedback data that can be four data elements per outbound message so the reason we have bigger data types like integer or for the integer um, is just to store a bigger number so a, a uh, eight byte number i don't remember my math but it can go up to a certain number but a, a four byte is much much smaller than that Professor, mm -hmm. uh, integer I understand, but uh, what is this big integer, small integer, and uh, the description stands with uh, starting with signed. So uh, that signed uh, does it indicate something? Mm -hmm. It does. Great. Yep. So the the small int going to what Craig and I were just talking about, the small int is only two bytes of memory, so sixteen bits of memory which I think the maximum integer is 32 million, if I'm remembering my numbers right, or it's 16 million, something like that. It's some power or two. Uh, signed means it can be either positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And then so that's that's our small int. Then our, our int, or int four or integer, the signed four byte integer is, uh, it can be a much larger number. And then the signed eight byte integer, that should be byte, um, is even much much larger. So eight bytes of memory compared to two bytes of memory, your your number can be a lot bigger. If you think about it from a, a binary standpoint, zeros and ones. Okay. So lots so more powers of different. two. Sorry. Yeah, all these are different, like uh, integer, big integer, and small integer. Correct. It's only the space which they occupy in the database. That is absolutely correct. Yep. Okay. Yep, that's exactly right. And and the space that they occupy in the database, which leads to the minimum and maximum value they can be. Okay. Let me quick Google uh, Postgres integer ranges. So, yeah, here we go. The 2-byte, a small int, is negative 32,768 to positive 32,768. So if your data set's going to be within that, that 64,000 range between negative 32,000 and positive 32,000, you can use that small int to save space in your, in your database. An integer is negative, that's a lot of numbers, 2 billion to positive 2 billion. And then the 8 byte is, is a whole lot more numbers than that. I don't know how, how big of a number that is. I don't even break it down. How many trillions or whatever number that is. The same thing goes for the, the floating point numbers. The double precision is an 8-byte float, float being a decimal. It can store decimals. Um, the numeric is a 4-byte. Is a and the real is a, oh sorry, the real is a four byte. What is numeric? Exact precision of a selectable precision. I don't know what that means. Up to 13,000, 131,000 digits before the decimal, up to 16.3 thousand digits after the decimal. That's what the numeric field is. I can add a column in this uh, after class to keep those ranges because I think it just gives you kind of the idea of why you would have those those bigger um, that bigger that more memory, so the precision is the the the, the numbers after the decimal point. So when we say double precision, it is more numbers on the right of the decimal point.
Any other questions about the different numbers? The number, is the, num uh, the money currency amount, is that the same as real? It's like float or dollar position or? Let me find that on the Postgres site. I didn't even I didn't know that was a uh, fee in a data type until I was reading the website today. So I'm totally curious what they say about it. Money type which stores currency amounts with a fixed fractional precision. That fractional precision is based on what you may set on the IC money locales when formatting blah blah blah. So it will keep a precision that you specify is what it looks like. It doesn't look like it is a preset size like the big int, etc. It's an eight byte field. Yeah, I'd have to f do some more reading to see why I have that compared to a float. So I would think to me it's similar. Okay. Moving to strings. So strings are typically used for storing text or uh, binary data. Um, binary data meaning it can be like an image or a PDF file or something like that. Uh, but as far as the data types go, um, we have a bit, a bit, sorry my typing again. Um, the first one is a bit, it is a fixed length bit string. Bit varying is like a, the, let's talk about the characters first and then it'll apply it to the others. So the character, uh, the first one, the character with the N, it's a fixed size, a fixed length character string, meaning if you have a character two field, you can only have up to two characters in that field. It's a fixed amount of memory. Uh, the varying, the character varying or the varchar um, is a variable length character string up to whatever that N is. So when we make uh, you saw on, on the slides before, when I make this table, I'm using a variable character length of up to 255. If that were a character field of, of 255 bytes, every, every record in that table would have 255, 255 bytes allocated to that character, that, that uh, attribute. When they're a variable character length, um, it's dynamic memory used, so it's not a fixed amount, of, a fixed size. So it's always um, the length is always up to whatever n is, where character is a fixed length. And so bit and bit varying are um, the same things, but for binary data. And uh, byte array is is the, these three are set for binary data. Text is a uh, another string data type that is meant to store large amounts of text. So this could be the paragraphs in a book or a full book. Um, it's those text fields that, that you could do things like um, te full text analysis or full text searching, which is a whole different topic, um, but you could perform more operations on a text field to uh, treat data as a large block of text. Are there any differences between bar char and text? Because they are all variable length variables. They they are. Um, var so when it comes to the differences, um, if you're or, or when it comes to practice, I should say, if you have like a, a fixed or a, a standard data element like a name, um, it's it's always a var char because it's it's usually um, a, a pretty tightly bound size for data. So either, you know, I don't know why I always pick 255 for mine, but you know, you, can, you know, 1,024 bytes is a, or is a, a kilobyte. So you, you, you keep them more like that, that um, small, they're going to be smaller than your text. Your text fields are used for uh, much larger, much larger data. But as far as how they're stored, um, 
I'm not sure what the difference would be. Are there any upper limit for tax? Like how many billions of uh, currency? Not that I'm aware of. And those are the kind of questions I always go to documentation for. Um, Okay, so yeah, text is is not a length validated number or a length validated field. It can be of any length, but a var car is a, a length validated string. That's the difference. Uh, time and date time and date fields, time and time data types. Um, you have everything from a date, which is a calendar date, year, month, and day. Um, an interval is a time span, so if you want to store a specific hour as a time span. Um, a specific time of day, using a time or a time zone, or a, a time without time zone or a time with time zone field. Uh, time stamp without time stamp or time stamp with time stamp without time zone or a timestamp with the time zone. Uh, time zones are always the hardest part of computing. Um, whenever you're building a database, uh, in my opinion, it is always best to store your time zones so you know um, you're sure what the date, what the timestamp of a field is. So if you don't, then you get confused on which system did it come from, what the timestamp was at that point in time, if it's logging kind of data especially. Um, the difference is here, um, the date, a date would be a, a non-time specific measure. So someone's birth date or the first date someone was a customer or um, a, a, when the membership renewal is. And those things that, that are a, a, you're representing the day that something is happening, not a specific time of that day. Um, the time stamps are the date and time together. And that's where if you're, you're dealing with um, a business process that has to run or the time an event was logged on in a system, uh, then your time zones are going to be important, especially if you're building a system that has um, users or, or data sources that are in different time zones, so distributed systems. Good questions. Network data types. Um, these are a relatively new thing in databases. Um, keeping things like an IP address so we have a CIDR, which is a network address. Network the network address meaning it, it can be a range of of IP addresses. So if you're familiar with how computer networking works, a CIDR is used to specify a range of IP addresses. Um, an INET is a specific IP address, whether it's IPv4, or IPv6, and then a MAC address, a MAC adder, um, is used to represent a hardware address of a network card. So now we're getting more into these kind of specialty data types. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the difference between the first and the second? Um, so think about an INET being one host, one computer, one server, right? Your computer has an IP address. A CIDR, CIDR is a range. So um, if we're talking about like an IPv4 thing, uh, your computer might have an IP address or an INET address of 192.168.1.10. But your home network could be in the range of 192.168.1 through 255. So that range would be represented with a CIDR in the CIDR notation. Got it. Thank you. We're not going to go into to what CIDR notation is and how we use it and anything like that. That's not terribly important for right now. 
So, quick question is, mm-hmm. the whole network at our place right now includes Cider and Inet, both of them. Sorry, can you, can you say that again? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm saying that, so the network at home, normally it includes both types or less Cider, Inet, or either one. Um, your, so the INET field would be used to represent one host, one computer. It's a single IP address. CIDR represents a range of IP addresses, contiguous IP addresses. So when one device logs in, we will have two types of data, like CIDR and INET. No, so so no, you would ha- you would have one one inet one IP address for if you were logging the IP address of the server that logged in or or the IP address of the computer that the user was using. Um, what you would use a CIDR range for would be things like um, if you wanted to report on all of the IP addresses that ha- that were on the third floor of your office. Um, your network administrator would put the third floor of your office, all the IP addresses in a specific range. So then you could query your database by that range. So it's, it's more of a, um, the, the question you typically would be asking is, is this INET part of this CIDR range? Or is this INET not part of this CIDR range? I think I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you'll use these typically when you are logging or auditing, uh, think you know things in a, a computer network. Um, exactly the example somebody said of logging in when a user logs in, or when a server downloads a file, or when a um, user requests a website, you'll you'll track things like the user's IP address, the server's IP address, and the URL of what they were requesting. I have a background in network security and that's exactly the tools that I built was was tracking who did what on a network. And so my database stored a whole lot of IP addresses. I would have used the INET data field. But if I want to query things by range or um, yeah, I would use a CIDR to kind of be a lookup to say, to kind of correlate um, that one IP to the, to, to the CIDR range. Geospatial data types. Uh, these are one, this is actually the data types that, that led me to use Postgres for the first time. Um, I was doing a GPS logging application for fun and um, Postgres has has this geospatial stuff built in natively. It's really neat. Um, so if you think about a you know a Cartesian plane, uh, you know with your x y axes like you did in geometry, um, you can store a whole bunch of different representations of that in your database. Um, so you can you can store a box type which represents a rectangle. So you can imagine you'll have three parts of that. One would be a point, a point or a, or a well, yeah, literally a point and then a height and a width to represent a a rectangle. Um, Everything is kind of based on a point. That's kind of the lowest denominator thing. It is a one specific point on your uh, geometric plane, in your your Cartesian plane, your geometric plane, whatever you want to, whatever you're representing. So everything's based on a point. Um, A box is a rectangle bound by a point or starting at a point. A circle uh, is a uh, point and a radius. A line is a point and a vector, I guess, a point and, and the, the slope of a line through it. A line segment is two points, and the line, re- the line segment represents everything between those two points. A path is uh, multiple points. So if you think about a, a fitness tracking application um, that tracks your run, uh, the, your, your running path is the GPS location that you are at every 10 seconds. And so when you store those in a database, uh, you could store that run as a path, and a path can have multiple points in it. 
um, that's slightly different than a polygon. A polygon is a path, but where the start and the end are the same point. So it is a closed shape. So I know I've said things like GPS a lot for this, but you can also use this for, for games, you know, where your characters are at a point in time. Um, you can use this for a whole bunch of different things. Um, I have some questions below, so we'll get to the questions about all these in a second. But any questions about these geospatial types? Those are Postgres specific data types. I don't see any English. Sorry, I can't hear you. You're quiet. So, question is: Are those geospatial data types uh, Postgres specific? They are. Yep, they are Postgres specific. Good question. Can we get an exercise on these? Because I, I feel they are interesting. Oh, yeah. We can make stuff up. Yeah, it'll be fun. Okay, thank you. I'm going to write that down before I forget. And then a, a kind of a collection of other things in the data type list that didn't really fill in with those... Uh, other categories. Um, there are two JSON data types. So if you're familiar, JSON is the JavaScript object notation. Um, it is how you represent objects in JavaScript. Um, it's a, a it is a structure used to make a map. A map is a key value pair data structure. So you can store things like strings and numbers and um, strings, numbers, Booleans, arrays, other objects. Um, so it's a kind of a, a data transport technology that's much simpler than things like XML. Uh, but there are data types in Postgres um, where you can store JSON data. And the neat thing about that is that when you're when you're retrieving your data, you can specify um, specific attributes of the the record that you're storing or the field you're storing. Um, I'm not quite sure the difference between the text and the binary. Um, I feel like I've only used the JSON B, but I don't know the difference. So that's something we, we can research. Um, PGLSN is a data type, the Postgres SQL log sequence number. I guess that's a global type to track um, the order of log entries. TS query and TS vector have to do with text searching. Um, so if you think about Google as a text search engine, um, you can type in things like uh, Robert and it'll still return things like Bob for a name or street. It can do aliases like lane or road, etc. cetera. Um, full text search is a, a class of its own and one of my favorite topics. Um, but, but that's what TS Query and TS Vector are used for. Uh, TX Snapshot, Snapshot ID, I don't know what that is. Um, UUIDs are globally unique identifiers or universally unique identifiers. Uh, you would use these as primary keys a lot. Um, if you've ever seen a UUID, it is a big long string. Let me show an example. Example UUID. So in the chat, I just posted a very long string. That is a UUID. Uh, it's, it's a statistically guaranteed unique identifier that uh, no computer will ever duplicate. Ever. I think it's like a 670 years is the current estimation of when a duplicate will happen. Um, and then XML data type, very much like the JSON data type. You can store XML data in it, um, and then you can have access to the, the different fields within your XML document. The JSON and the XML uh, you will typically see as almost a way of having a, a generic data model 
associated with um, a record in your database. So an example for our class, um, when we talked about things like bikes and accessories, um, bikes have standard things like height or uh, yeah, whatever, size, weight, color, um, style, you know, those are things that would be their own database column. Uh, but if then you wanted to have a generic uh, set of data where a different manufacturer might have other attributes they want to mention in their um, in their description, but you don't want to change your, mo your data model for, you can have a generic structure like a JSON structure where they can specify um, whatever they want and your, your application can then render that data however you want to. Um, so it's almost a way of having, yeah, having a generic data model. So whether it's JSON or XML, you can accomplish the same thing. Um, I think maybe a better example would be our accessories. Um, if we have different types of accessories, you know, some are helmets and helmets have certifications um, and other accessories could be different tools. They don't have certifications, but they have strength and they have um, specific sizes and styles. Um, so in that in that database table, you could have a JSON structure on your uh, records that each type or each really each entry could have uh, their own generic data structure with other descriptors for it. Um, you'd use something like this if you were building a kind of a generic shopping cart or shopping um, system. Uh, and then, okay, so, so then taking all of that data type example, um, let's figure out when we would use them. So if we had to track somebody's account balance, what data type do you think we would try to use? Probably the money type. Money feels right. What else could be using until I figure out why we wouldn't use the other ones? You could use a you know, float or a reel or something like that if we had to. Um, money does feel right, so I would look there first. What about a user's last name? Varkar. Of our car. I have a question for the money. Uh huh? Is it the for the money field? Is it that it includes the currency and then the float, like the number, or it's only the currency because we have a lot of currencies? If we if it only includes the number, we can do with float. So I'm not sure if money includes both components of the currency and the number. Yeah, it, it doesn't look like it, it stores anything except the currency amount. Like on the uh, Postgres uh, data type page, I'll paste the link in here too. Um, the description of a money type is the currency amount. see I guess the loss of precision it is a double precision yeah I think it's specifically specifically created for rounding and casting errors uh, I guess it, it includes the sample because it says such as, and then there is a dollar sign, and then thousand. Um, and so that is so here the, the, the fractional precision, the range, blah, 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 input. Input is accepted in a variety of formats, including an integer and a floating point literal, as well as a typical currency format. So if we were inserting data into this table, we could pass it in looking like that dollar sign one comma zero 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 dot zero zero and it knows how to interpret that and it'll just store one thousand point zero zero um, and then okay so then output is generally in the latter form so when you get data out it'll look like a dollar with the dollar sign that's pretty interesting. 
Let's play with that for a second. I have a SQL developer up. Now. All right, so we see this. So let's create a table. And then balance money. I have created my balance table. So that the description on the site says uh, integer floating point literal as well as typical currency formatting such as. So my first one is my floating point literal string with the currency format and then an integer. So if I run that, so all the rows got inserted. And then when I select it, Bad value for type double one. Huh. So does it actually default it to a double instead of a currency? Yeah, that's a great question. So it is a money type. Well, it really doesn't like that. <coughs> See, did I install PG admin? I'm wondering if that's a SQL developer thing. Share. All right, so this is my PG admin. Um, How'd you get there? It's just a. It's part of the Postgres installation, so it's just its own application I run. So it's an alternative to SQL Developer. So if you download the full installable from po for Postgres, you can actually skip the database and only install PG Admin if you wanted to. So what I'm curious about is, is this going to like that better or not? It did. 
So the output looks like currency. I think that's the other description. The output is generally in the latter form, but depends on the locale. You got to get closer to your mic again, Tal. Uh, okay. What if we want to store the value, the money in euro? Can you hear me? Yeah, no, sorry, I'm thinking. What if we want to store the value in euros? Um, you're not, the, the, it's money, it's not storing a specific currency. So the, the formatting of the output looks like it's based on an LC monetary setting, which is part of the database itself. Um, is it a database itself or is it my user interface? I don't know. So yeah, it's just storing. It's just storing the 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 um, the, amount. the amount, right? All right. Uh, users' age. How would we store users' age? It's a calculated field. So say it again. Sorry, I need to turn my volume up too. Uh, it's a calculated field, so we have to subtract something from, like the uh, current dates from the birth date, I guess, right? Yep, it, it could very well be a calculated field. So, um, what did you say we would calculate it based on? What 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 uh, data type would you use to calculate it from? Current date and birth date. Okay, birth, so birth date, but what type would a birth date be? That would be a calendar date. Date, yeah. Yeah, it would be a, would be a date field. But good, good on coming up with a calculated age. Um, Geofencing, is everyone familiar with what geofencing is? I think they do, and most of the time we deal with spatial uh, data types. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so geo, right, um, geofencing, an easy example, I think, is if you have like a, you know, smart stuff in your house um, and you want your lights to automatically turn on when you get home or when you tell Siri, um, you know, turn off my notifications when I get home. And so the when I get home is based on a couple of things. You know, where is your home? So how would you store your home in the database? Point. Yep. So your home would be the point. And how could you store when I get home? Timestamp. Uh, it's a set time, I guess. OK. so. You're focusing on the time part of it, which is ba good based on what I said. Um, but if you're thinking about the physical part of it, it'd say... It's like matching your the current... Like a sensor? Sensor could work. Like you have a GPS sensor on your phone. How does yeah. it know when you're home? You'd either use another point or you use a path, right? Just to... But... Yeah, I think an intersection of a of the point at which you are, so that's your point, and then your uh, uh, maybe a circle around your house if you're within twenty feet of your house. So a, a twenty foot radius around the point at which represents your house. So your house or your home could be a circle, or a box around the point, or heck, a polygon, like if you're doing your ring camera. Motion zones, that's a whole bunch of polygons. Um, ankle bracelet is very much like geofencing, but how would you store where an ankle bracelet wearer was? Ankle bracelets are like 
if the police are tracking your location. It's getting dark. It's getting dark. What? Yo, I know, right? I went downhill quick. Um, <laughs> I don't know why that came to mind, but how would you how would you log that ankle bracelet's location? I have to make, to measure the radius, so maybe it's like. Um... Yeah, there's a couple parts to this. There's the, uh, where is the user right now? Where is the user allowed to be? And uh, when do we call the police when they're not in that area? So you need a couple of things to track this stuff. But like, if I wanted to keep a history or a log of where the ankle, ankle bracelet was all day, what data points would I use? Point. Yeah, point. Okay. And time. With or without a time stamp. Or with or without a time zone. With a time zone. Because? Uh, because you need to have a standardized unit of measure. Good answer. Okay. So we have logged um, my ankle bracelet all day. I don't have an ankle bracelet. We've logged my ankle bracelet all day. Um, and now to set up a geofence that says I can't leave my house, I can use, we just talked about a couple other types to represent. Circle. circle. Yeah, circle or a box or something like that. Yep. Do um, you have Boolean at all? I mean, you could. You could store, like, is this point inside of the box, you know, for your, your log entries, yeah. So log entries like that, like even the network monitoring thing, um, log entries are a typically a, a measurement at a specific point in time. Um, and so that specific point in time is usually done with a timestamp with time zone. Um, if you're measuring things that you need, like the accuracy of, you know, a second or what second, a second based measurement. Um, if you're, if you're recording the average temperature for a day, what timestamp would you use to represent the day? Average temperature for the day. You use a date. Yeah. Because I'm not representing a time, just really a date. Time and date. Oh, yeah, because you just talked about the average temperatures of a day. So I'm just wondering if we are talking about the temperature, the, the, the actual temperatures, or the day of the temperature. Um, so you remember, or if you ever watch the Weather Channel, uh, they always say, and today's high is the highest on record since this date in 1964, right? So imagine they have a database that every record represents the date the high temperature and the low temperature for that day it's not a point in time throughout that day so they don't track what the the temperature at 11 a.m was it's just what was the high and the low for that day um, so this is where we start going into those those data modeling or data modeling um, when we use words like average um, that is not a specific point in time measurement. When we use things like uh, or the, the temperature at 7 a.m., now we have to have that time attribute involved. And the date matters as well, so you use a timestamp, which is date and time. Um, if you're doing things like calendars, modeling calendars, and you say, or an alarm clock, wake me up at 7 a.m. every day, um, then you use a time, what was it? A time field. Because date is irrelevant. It's the wake up call at 7 a.m. So that's why we have these permutations of time, date, and timestamp, which is time plus date. So it all depends on what you're measuring. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Okay, and we talked about UUIDs, JSON, and XML. Why do you think 
So I, when we're talking about UUIDs, I said they're a great data type for a primary key. Why would I use a UUID and not an integer sometimes? Or can you think of any examples of why I might want to use an, a UUID and not an integer? Devices, maybe? Why devices? Because they have like serial number and um, you use this device universally. I don't know. Okay. Alphanumeric. It is alphanumeric. So I use it if I if I were going to if I didn't want to URL hack something. So like if I were in a URL, um, you know that pointed to an entry that that retrieved an item from a database. So like, you know, mikespikes.com slash products slash six, and that pulled up the entry for primary key six. Ooh, then I would try seven. Exactly. But if I had a, a UUID, then it would be harder to, you know, try to guess or figure out. Does everyone follow that? That is a perfect example. Could you please read? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, so imagine our Mike's Bikes website. And uh, we don't know anything about writing secure software, so we just write software. And we're building the administrative side of things, okay? And we have an employee login page, and the page URL says um, mikespikesadmin.com slash paystubs slash seven. And that's my paystub. You know, I get a PDF of my paystub. If we use that integer primary key, and I'm a curious person, I'll change my URL from seven to eight to get Michael's pay stub to figure out why you're paying him more than me or less and I can make fun of him. It's easy to guess what the other records are. When you use a UUID, it's a 6, 40, 40, 32 character random string. It is impossible to guess the next value, and so you're 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 hiding. Um, you can hide your data easier, so that's a great use of a UUID. Oh, I understand. I was in that situation before when I was trying to. I lost my URL and was trying to remember it by replacing the number, but it didn't work. Exactly. Okay. So when you use predictable things like an employee ID in a URL, um, if you know somebody else's employee ID, then you can try replacing it with other data. Will, will that ever change with like, I know this is like random, but like with quantum computing stuff? like Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, quantum computing changes everything. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's scary because it's really not science fiction anymore. <laughs> it's almost a thing now. Um, yeah. Okay, so if you are curious about creating tables and all the options you can use to create your database tables, um, this is what documentation on the Postgres website looks like. There are a lot of options when you're creating a database table. Oh, uh, Professor? Yep. Um, I have a question. Um, last lecture, you explained the serial and sequence and this stuff. So if I want my serial to start after a specific number, for example, I don't want it to start from one. I want it to start from like 1,000. Yep. How can I initialize the number? Uh, uh, to the Google. Postgres sequence starting number. So, do, 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 do. the syntax is something like create sequence, sequence name as data type, increment by a number, min value or max value or start. There's, there's options and you'll see a page that looks very much like this. Um, when you talk about sequences. So Postgres SQL sequences. Let's 
So I can create my sequence, minval, maxval, start. So I can have a, uh, that starting number is that first number you'll get. So if you don't want one, you can have 14,312 or whatever you wanted. Okay. So basically it's similar to Oracle, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yes. The, the big difference between a Postgres serial or Postgres um, sequence is that it can be directly assigned to the database column. And, and the last time I used Oracle, you couldn't do that. So you couldn't have that uh, auto incrementing primary key as the example. Now it's been probably a decade since I've touched Oracle. We, we can't do the auto increment. Isn't next value is the auto increment? Exactly. Right? So you, you specifically have to say insert ID sequence name dot next val. Oh, my God. Right. But here, when we have a serial data type, it does all that behind the scenes for you. And when we insert a record, should we like write something for uh, the ID or just leave it like a blank? Just leave it blank. Like don't even okay. don't even insert that column. Okay. Um, okay, I'm looking at our time. We have ten minutes left. Let's roll through constraints really quickly. Uh, we've talked about some constraints. This is this is pulled from that create table concept. Um, we've talked about a not null constraint, meaning every every field of that type, every field of that attribute has to have a value. Um, null means it's nullable. Um, there's another constraint called a check constraint. Um, you can run an operation. No, I'll get to that in detail. But the way I'm looking at this, I'm going down. So we can set a default value for this field. It's, it's called a constraint. Uh, we can set a unique constraint, meaning I can only ever see this value once in this table primary key, references being a um, foreign key. Um, I'm going to skip the deferrables. OK, so those are those. So uh, you can name your constraints. You don't have to name your constraints. Um, the database will come up with uh, generic names. But for our create table example, we can create this, this films table with four, five, six fields. And then we are adding a unique constraint called production on the date prod column. So every entry in that date prod attribute needs to be a needs to be unique across the table. So if this is the production date of a film of my films, I can't have the same production date of two films. Uh, a check constraint, it, it's essentially running a logic check um, using SQL-like SQL data, uh, uh, SQL-like programming uh, to validate things. Uh, this first example for the column says we have a DID field, or, or distributors, distributor ID field. Um, the check or the constraint is, is the DID greater than 100? If we try to insert a record that's less than 100, we'll get a constraint uh, failure message. And another cool thing is, so that's a specific constraint on a specific field. Um, we can add a constraint on the on the table, which can do things like check more more than one fields on that record. So in this case, we can check is the DID greater than 100, and does the name not equal an empty string. So this format here is exactly like a where structure when we start. I don't think we've done too much where yet in our SQL queries, um, but it's the same kind of validation or, or checking to see if this is a true or a false scenario. Uh, we've seen primary keys. Um, this example is adding the constraint 
with the code title name for a primary key on two columns, code and title. So this is a uh, multi-part primary key or multi-column primary key. Primary keys also must be unique. All right, so if we look at Mike's bikes data, um, y'all did a really good job on the ERDs. I think I said that at the beginning of class, but I want to reiterate, like, they were really, really good. Um, so I'm going to make it harder now for you. Um, but anyway, good job. So here, uh, I want to start on the easy side. Um, I wanted to break out an addresses table. So we can create a table addresses with a primary key ID, uh, serial ID, uh, street one, two, and three, city, state, and zip. Would you change anything in there? You could change the state to not be var charts and just gonna always be like a fixed length of two. And why would I? I think to I think it has to do with capacity, right? For to help preserve like because it's gonna create enough space. I can't remember. Something like that. But this actually does specify that it has to be a length of two. It it specifies up to a length of two. Okay. Yeah, it's good to be long. Well, I mean in the U.S., it couldn't. I mean, with all of our states, we have two character states. Um, that that question just was to see like uh, how you think about it, because a a there a character field. If it's a two byte character field, it is two bytes of data. A variable character field. Just knowing how computers work, there has to be something that says. This is how big that individual field is, and then here's that individual field's data. I bet you at some point in time, um, if the var char is small enough, then it's there's more overhead in describing the field than there is just having a fixed size. But I think that's that's such a low level detail. I wouldn't sweat it unless you have. Ten, mm -hmm. Sorry. Isn't isn't like putting the type as var char will um, impose an error? For example, if I'm entering data for a state and I entered like one letter, so I might have an error, right? Mm -mm. So having no. two characters. No, um, a, a var char can have up to that number of characters, so it can but have. It will it, allow one, right? If I do a var char two. I can have zero, one, or two characters in that field. Yeah, but it will affect the integrity. For example, if I made a mistake and entered only one character, for example, uh, Virginia, I inserted only V, so it will accept it, and this will impose like an error, right? Nope, no error. Nope, no if error. If you wanted it to cause an error, you could create a reference table with all of the valid codes and. Good answer. Or you could do a check if you really wanted to. Either way, right. I, a, a check would you would check the length, but having uh, the fifty plus all of our uh, localities or whatever we call them, um, that'd be a big list to have in a check. But yeah, you could do a a related table for a reference, so you could have a list of known and valid states, and that would be a good thing for your data integrity. So good job getting there. Kudos. Um, well, would you ever need a 255 characters for a city? I pick a number that's big enough to make sure to store it all. Oh, okay. Uh, table for customers. So customer table, ID, serial primary key, first name, last name, address, int, references, address, ID. So that is a foreign key to my... Uh, addresses table. Should that be nullable or not? Well, not all your customers are going to want to give an address. Perfect answer. Perfect answer. 
Unless they're online, in this case, we're assuming Mike's Bikes has both an online presence and a absolutely in-store presence. Yep, yep. In store, I used to hate it when Radio Shack asked me for my email address. I'm like, I'm buying a three dollar connector. You're not getting my email address. So yeah, exactly. So this goes back to knowing the business, knowing how the business operates, how the customers are, um, all those interview questions. Like that's when you. We would think, yes, sure, everyone should have an address, but in reality, they may not want to give it to us. Uh, so homework. Finish creating my tables for me. Um, I didn't specify what fields you should create, uh, but if you're talking about a manufacturer's table, um, give me at least the bare minimum of fields you think we should have in a manufacturer's table. Um, I'm not going to say we need a name, we need an address, we need a zip code, we need a primary point of contact, all that kind of stuff. Um, but come up kind of with a reasonable thing to make some value out of a table, like a manufacturer's table. Um, only worry about these tables, addresses, customers, manufacturer, distributor, distributed items, bikes, and inventory. Don't worry about accessories and services. Well, I wrote that twice. Um, only focus on those plus any you need to join them together, specifically many-to-many -many relationships. And I want it in a SQL file, which is a text file. So this is where your SQL developer or your PG admin would come in handy. Uh, Tau, I think PG admin might be a good uh, option for you. Um, and submit it in Canvas by next week. I'll put the actual assignment in there with this description so you can reference it. We're at time, but if anybody has any questions, let me know. I have a question. Um, addresses for entities with addresses. Are we just assuming one to one? Uh, no, I would do uh, many to one or one to many from an address like spouses, kids, all at the same address. And then, are we going? Are we ordering straight from the distributor, or are we no. ordering from the manufacturer? Um, both. Okay. Both. Cool. Thank you. Um, so if we got a good result on our ER diagram, mm -hmm. uh, is it safe to assume that the join tables that we used are, are fine to use for this? Uh, if I didn't call it out in my response to you as like, this is weird or move this, I think this join should be here. Um, those are the kind of feedback I gave. If I didn't give you that, then I think yours is it's fine. And not all those are, are graded yet, right? Uh, yeah, I thought I did most, I thought I finished them, but now I'm recollecting I might have left like three or four that I didn't finish. I'll do that immediately after I stop recording. So if I missed yours, who was that? Was that Rachel? Yeah, that was me. Okay, I'll, I'll explicitly check yours first. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. No, 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 not at all. All right. Thanks, Thank folks. You. We Thank I you. will see you on Thursday. Thank you. Hey, Chris. Yes, sir. Have a good night. Quick question uh, on the distributed items here. What what exactly is uh, asking like joint table between distributor and bikes? Mm -hmm. I mean, writing queries. No, you need a table to to relate to the bikes to the distributor. Bikes to the distributor. So many to many relations. Uh, bikes distributor will be a many to many relate. Well, the distributed items is your linking table. Yes, it's your linking table. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. So every bike will have a manufacturer, but not every bike will be distributed by a distributor. Okay. Ooh, I just realized that's a confusing one. Anyway, I'll see what y'all come up with because it's fun. I'm a very easy grader.